Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Pact Overrest. In case you're wondering why it's called Pact Overrest, it's because we just named it that way. So there we go. Um, and um, okay, so welcome, everyone, to uh, our event about Hacktoberfest. So you might have heard from Henry about 30 seconds ago about this word called open source. And um, it is fine if you don't know what it is. To be honest, two years ago, I didn't know what it is. Now I don't still don't really know what it is, but that is fine. So uh, this is a joint event essentially hosted by the Developer Student Club at UW and the App Development Club at UW. And I guess let's go ahead and talk about what these two words even mean. So the key word here is Hacktoberfest. Now, what is Hacktoberfest? Hacktoberfest is a essentially a months long event that is hosted by this uh, company called DigitalOcean. And what it is, is basically, you might've noticed that it arrives with October. So hence it takes place in October. For those of you who weren't quite familiar with the concept of open source, essentially what it is, is it means your source code is open. As in, instead of trying to hide your nitty gritty code, you open it to everyone and there are different definitions of, of what open source is. There are different varying degrees of how much freedom open source grants you. But in essence, the umbrella term open source means you're not hiding your source code. You are letting other people look at it, scrutinize it, maybe contribute to it, maybe change it. So it is a bit of a contrary ideal to um, the antonym of open source, which is you might heard either closed source or proprietary which is what a lot of corporate software tends to run on because you know they're corporations and they don't like you looking at their stuff or, or they don't really like you um, having too much freedom. Uh, I hope Google's not listening. Oh wait, this is a Google event. All right, I will try not to piss off Google in this event. So what does this mean that you can let your, let your source code for everyone to see? Well, in practice, this leads to a couple of things. One, it leads to the ability for the users and everyone to scrutinize and analyze the code. So you can't really hide anything in there. A lot of whistleblower situations happens when people try to hide things. When things are open, there are always eyes on it. So logically, you wouldn't be able to really hide something big without someone finding out. In practice, there are two effects of open source. One is that the users and the community can influence how the project goes. So technically everyone is a developer and this is precisely what you will be doing later on in today's session. You will be a developer in a sense of any of these projects. So I guess we're gonna go ahead and get started first with resources now that we kind of know what open source is. Oh, and also one thing I forgot to mention, um, the Pactober Fest is sort of a GitHub only event. Um, now GitHub is not the only Git service out there, but it is arguably one of the bigger ones. There is also stuff like Bitbucket and GitLab, um, but GitHub is owned by Microsoft. So please let us sink in for a second. But aside from that fact, we are gonna talk about a bit of uh, resources that you can use as a developer. So the GitHub Student Developer Pack is a series of tools and resources that are offered to students um, for free, I believe. Um, the, uh, the exact policies you might have to check because it might vary year on year. But essentially the idea is that you can verify your student status, much like how you verify your student status for Amazon Prime student. And you can achieve some free tools, such as the ultimate edition of the IntelliJ Java primarily Java integrated development environment. If you've taken certain classes, you might be used to using the community edition, which is the completely free version. This one, if you're not a student, you have to pay. And there are other things such as uh, DNS domains and much more. Um, and the list, the list might not stay the same year on year, so just keep an eye out for that. And um, you can also have some sort of a community to see what other students have created. And uh, GitHub also provided some flags for today's event. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. This is what we talked about a bit earlier about what open source is. Now, one of the key things is that FLOSS stands for free slash leave and open source software. FLOSS is a subset of open source essentially because not all open source projects are free slash leave. Now, the reason why it's free slash leave is because in English, free can have two major meanings. It means freedom or free of charge. In this situation, the reason why we tackle on leave is because 
The free here stands for freedom, not necessarily free of charge. That is a very important thing you have to remember about flaws. Now, the reason why it's a subset of open source is remember what we said earlier about what open source is. Open source simply means you expose your inner code to everyone, but that doesn't mean you grant them freedom. That's the key distinction. That's what FLOSS does. FLOSS essentially came out of a movement called the Free Software Movement back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and it introduces, it essentially pioneered the concept of copy left. If you've ever heard of the concept of copy right before, you'll know that it's, it basically works like someone copyrights a thing. If you use it, they're gonna come and kill you. Something like that. Essentially, a bit exaggerated, but in the corporate and legal world, that is what tends to be what happened. What, what usually happens. What copy left is essentially is it means I make something, I license it as copy left, as in I make it free for everyone to use, distribute, and a whole long list of freedom related terms. And anyone who takes my project and makes changes to it must also make that a copy left project. So the chain goes on and on and on. So at no point, if, if, if at any point you stop make your project copy left, that is essentially a violation of the license. And at which point people are gonna be quite mad. But um, that's where the two big domains of uh, open source comes in. Copy left and permissive. So the difference here is copy left, you must maintain your copy left chain. But permissive means you can do literally whatever you want, including if you write a permissive project and some big company takes it without crediting you, that's technically allowed, and that has happened in the past. So um, that's two big things that you must sort of keep in mind. And on the other end of the spectrum is proprietary licenses. For example, the end users license agreement. You might notice that every time you install a new update, you scroll through that entire thing. It tells you to read it. You don't read it. You click, I agree. That's what an end user license agreement is. It basically details all the things that you're not allowed to use and do, and you're allowed to do with your uh, software. For example, in the macOS uh, license agreement, you might see that it says you're only allowed to run it on physical Mac hardware. So that's an example of a end user's license agreement. And that is a overview of the open source uh, idea. So the main takeaway here that you should remember is open source is the big umbrella term. Hacktoberfest is about open source, not necessarily flaws. Floss is something you can choose to dive into deeper if you would like to. Like pretty big, uh, and then you'll, you'll see that um, the reason why we put the GNU sign up there is GNU stands for, uh, I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's, it's that cow icon. So GNU is essentially the, uh, the icon of the free software movement, and they've produced uh, and are majorly contrib contributors of certain software such as the GCC compiler, Linux, um, and much, much more. So I would say that you don't have to dive into Floss that much because Floss is potentially more of an ideology than um, a license, than just a license. But it's something that it might be fun to dig into. Like I personally had a lot of fun when I dug into Linux and Floss. So you talk to me about that, I guess. So when you have a big project, you have to be able to manage the code that people are submitting. And it's kind of like Google Docs version history. Git is just a version control system. So it keeps track of changes that people make and it lets you merge changes by different contributors into like the main um, source code of a project. So if you're going to be contributing to an open source project, you are probably going to be using Git. So what is it? It's a command line tool. If you want to get it, you can go to git-scm.com if you're on Windows. If you're on Mac OS, you probably already have it or you have an installer for it. Just type Git at the command line. iOS and Android, you can of course use Git on them as well. Of course, it'll be a bit harder unless you have a keyboard or something like that. But if you're on iOS and you want to use Git, there's working copy, which we mentioned before, which is an excellent Git graphical user interface, which lets you look kind of at the history on your phone and edit files as well. There's also a shell, which is not very much of a user interface. It lets you run the code as well for some projects. For example, it supports Python. On Android, there's Termux, which yes, it allows you to um, do a lot. Okay. Anyways, um, we're going to publish the PowerPoint and you can come back to the slide if you ever want to reference it. Okay. When you start to contribute to an open source project, a huge part of that is communication. So you have to be able to interact with others nicely. Otherwise, maybe someone will work on the same thing as you and then there will be wasted effort or 
maybe your pull request will come across as spam, or it will be hard for contributors to read. Because in open source, a bunch of people are doing this just for fun. So you want to make it easy for them to read your pull request and redo it. So first, most projects have an issue section where you can say, hey, there's a problem with this, or hey, there's a new feature I want to add. So before you start working on something, you should probably start an issue for it just to let people know this is already being worked on so there aren't two copies of the same thing. There's also often ways to reach out to open source communities that are working on a project. So they'll generally have a link to it on uh, their main page. So like Gitter, Telegram, Matrix, or some IRC thing. Also be patient because people are often doing this in their free time. They won't necessarily get back to you very quickly. So you have to be patient and uh, realize that your pull request might not get reviewed for a while. Okay, so how do you actually make a pull or merge request? A pull or merge request is where you submit some code to a project and you say, hey, merge this into the project. So you need to be respectful, concise, and include screenshots and examples. Uh, do not do what this one did, uh, which is just to fix, and then they put a number sign. <laughs> and I think that they didn't actually fix any issues. They just resubmitted some commits that were already in the project. Don't do that. Uh, people have done that for Hacktoberfest in the past because they thought they would just get the free swag. Uh, don't do that, please. Okay, um, what you should do is you should include a short summary um, up here, a longer summary down here, link it to issues, um, include a screenshot if it's applicable, and then go into more detail down below. Okay, so when you are writing a description for your pull request, you'll be using Markdown probably, unless you're using some strange Git service that does not support Markdown, which I don't really know of any. How many of you have typed something into Discord and bolded a word? If you bolded a word, you were using Markdown. So this is just a quick overview of Markdown. Uh, just put a number sign at the beginning of the line for a heading, uh, two stars for bolding, an underscore for italicizing, um, and Again, this will be published, so you can refer back to it at any time. So this might not be super useful to you right now, but just know that the slide exists. If you're on Windows or Mac OS, sometimes when you do git commit, which is saving the changes you've made in the history, it's basically saving on a Word document or a Google document, it'll add a, an entry to the history. It'll try to open Vim which is really, really hard for people who have not used it before to use. It has really weird key bindings. So you'll probably want to do git config dash dash global core dot editor and then some other editor name. If not, uh, how to get out of them, press escape, then type colon X to save an exit. So here's some general version control tips. We'll get back to this because this probably doesn't mean a lot right now. But anyways, you want to rebase instead of uh, merge when you're making a pull request. Rebasing is basically, um, so you have your work, you've saved it in commits, and you can either merge new changes in the upstream project into your work. So like you take their work and you have git compare them and find all of the places where it conflicts and then you fix all of the conflicts yourself. Or you can apply your commits one by one on top of uh, the changes that they've made to the project. So please apply your commits one by one to the changes that they made to the project. Because if your commits have a bunch of merges, the merges show up as commits themselves. And so the list of changes just gets huge and super long. Like when I didn't know what I was doing, I opened a pull request and it ended up having like a hundred something commits. And trying to go back and fix that was a nightmare. And eventually I just gave up on it. So don't do what I did, be better than me. You can also go back and change history if you want to clean things up. Again, that uses the rebase command. Okay, let's see some examples. Lucas, would you like to go first? Uh, I think that, okay, so in terms of examples, um, the two examples we have is Journal++, which is what Henry is going to demonstrate, and KDE Connect. I can speak for KDE Connect in that it is a relatively less busy project, as in a lot of the things that happens in there probably doesn't happen for a lot of bigger projects. And I think that, for most of the time, bigger projects might be what you will be interacting with. So I think Henry can start us off with the example of a somewhat busy repository. So Journal++ is a kind of big thing that you might want to contribute to, but I won't be showing that right now. Instead, I will be showing our club website, which you can also contribute to. So we have a GitHub repository for it. 
it is under our organization, which is on GitHub. You should request to join if you have not already. So here's our website. And um, so let's say I was going to open a pull request. I'd probably want to make an issue first. What's an issue with our website? It's really old and hasn't been updated in a long time. Website out of date. So I'm going to use Markdown. I'm going to start a header. Summary. The website still contains data, contains information about meetings from two years ago. So the asterisks are starting a bulleted list and the number sign starts a heading. And at this point, you would probably say something like, I have some time, the this upcoming week and would like to work on this. Up here, if you were submitting this to a project that wasn't ours, you'd probably want to include a bit more information, like um, how else is the website out of date? How do you plan to fix this, Apollo? Can you press the box size of course. And at this point, you would go ahead and click Submit New Issue. Then people can look at the issues list and see that there is someone working on this. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to use a Mac very well. So would someone else like to come and demonstrate cloning the repository? Okay, so um, it would appear that we are now cloning the repository. Um, so just as a side note, this is github.com, which is the platform that Hacktober was. Hacktober Fest will be taking place on. So um, it is a GitHub only thing, um, like I said earlier. So um, some open source projects might not be on GitHub, but the most primarily, the majority of them are on GitHub. So you should be fine in that regard. And just as a side note, um, a couple of years ago, there has been a change that if you want to participate in Hacktoberfest, you need to look for a repo with this tag right here, Hacktoberfest. Otherwise, it's not participating. And the reason being is uh, people keep spamming all the, re uh, all the repositories, so they added this. But just something to look out for. So uh, this right here is our website. And uh, yes, Henry said that we are not going to be cloning it. So let's go ahead and clone it. So now, um, as with any open source project, uh, Henry demonstrated how to walk through the issues. Now, after that, you, are probably, you probably want to give this source code a closer inspection. And while you can do that, just by clicking in the website, that is mostly unideal. So you might want to go ahead and pull the code. Um, however, one of the things you also need to keep in mind is whether, whether you have the proper integrated development environment. The first thing to make sure is that you have a proper tools, I suppose, to, um, that you prefer to check out whatever project it is. Because depending on what project it is, you probably need different tools for it. So in our case, ours is a website. So really, anything goes. Um, a lot of people like to use VS Code. You might use something made by JetBrains. You might use something different altogether. It doesn't really matter. But um, I'm not sure where VS Code is, but I guess we can just pull it. Um, OK, so let's go ahead and go here. So to pull the project, um, GitHub gives you a couple options. Um, you can do it by HTTPS, by SSH. So I, I'll, I'll demonstrate SSH later on um, as, a, as a side note, because if you don't have a setup, you actually can't use the SSH option. So we're going to go we're gonna go, go through that if you don't have a setup. The SSH option is nice, but it's not required. It yes. means you don't have to type your password. Mm -hmm. It is nice, but it's not required. Okay. Um, so uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to prepare ourselves a nice uh, place for a project to go to. Did you, did you copy the... No, I, I didn't do anything. You need to, you need to like prepare the... Okay, so I guess what I'm doing is that I, for this website, I'm going to go ahead and create a folder for it. Uh, so to just match up with this, I'm going to copy this and create a folder that's named after it. So we will go home. Um, home is slash, what do you call this character? I don't know, but this is home. Wait, wait, wait. This is home, okay. Everyone remember this, this is home. So let's go home. 
So currently, um, you can see the SQLs. Okay. So we are currently at home. So that's good. Um, and also let's see what we have here. So um, how about let's there we go for in dev now. Beautiful. All right. So as you can see here, Gladys have other projects in dev. And what we're going to do now is if we just run git clone inside this directory, it's actually going to clone uh, the remote in here with the name of the remote. So you don't actually have to manually make a folder called github.io, which is nice. Okay. So now we are going to uh, use this convenient copy button. Boop. And now, and now we will uh, do git clone. Well, first of all, uh, to know if you have Git installed, you can always just type Git. If it says Git not found, that means you don't have Git. But in this situation, I did man Git, which is manual Git. And now you have all the Git stuff and all the beautiful options that it has. Git can be frustrating sometimes, but um, such is the journey. So we will do Git clone, paste that, enter. And now we have cloned it. So now if we go to the, uh, the directory, uh, so we will see that we have cloned this. So this should help you have an easier time examining exactly what the source code is. If you have um, some sort of a IDE such as Visual Studio, you can open this inside Visual Studio. I actually haven't really used Visual Studio code before, um, so I'm not gonna try to do that. Um, so now we will see that we can examine the source code. And this is typically the second step that you will use when you're contributing to anything, because you want to really narrow down what the problem is, how you can contribute. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the issues tab again to give ourselves a refresher. Let's take a look. Um, so um, we just created website out of date. Okay. And let's see if there's any more specific issues that um, can potentially be fixed. Include link to public events calendar. Hmm. Let's say that you look at that and you want to be like, hey, you know what? I think I should do that. That sounds helpful. Um, well, first thing you need to know, you need to sort of um, narrow down is exactly how you're going to do it. So usually projects are organized by folder and usually people name them quite um, straightforward so you know what they are for. So for example, in Discord, there is all the Discord resources. Um, and you can see that it's this cross over here. And uh, for images, you can see there's a bunch of images such as, um, that's me, such as uh, logos. And really at this step, you wanna go ahead and look at issues and then narrow down exactly what you wanna fix. Now, I don't think we're gonna figure out exactly what we're gonna fix right at this moment, but this is the rough gist of what you would do to um, to narrow down the, uh, the issues. So I guess the, 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 the plan for now is that you're going to basically start looking at repositories and stuff, and we will help you with things that we can help with. And while we are doing that, I'm going to try to find some projects for you up here, not for you, but like just browse through projects and stuff like that, and then show you more examples of what typically happens in open source uh, dynamics. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so everyone else, uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and someone will hopefully come to help you. At the same time, let's go ahead and take a look at what Hacktober has, has to offer. Do you need help, Henry? Yeah, we're fine. Okay, good. Hacktober Fest. And then let's go ahead and explore. Uh, there's a lot of things in here. There's a start hacking button there and you click on that button to sign your yeah. up. And out when you walk in the room, uh, the green one will show you how to use the markdown syntax to format the text. Uh, when you're creating a pull request or responding to any of the messages, and the red one will show you the steps about cloning, uh, creating branches, open pull requests, um, and yeah. So you can reference those when you go home, but I guess we'll now help you. Um, I mean, one thing I can do is I can literally just go here and then click on this. Right. Uh, the other, 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 the 
O Y Z S H Python material UI. 